If you like the video, then please consider supporting Slopes Game Room on Patreon. There's a lot of weird games out there, and obviously, Seaman is, well, is pretty high on the list. I remember hearing about this gem before the days of YouTube and before the big guns reviewed it making it pretty much a household name for any retro historic fan searching the tubes. Now that's not me going down the route of I knew this game before it was cool to know it blah blah blah, not at all. Because if I'm going to be honest, yes I saw some pictures of the quirky Tamagotchi like game in the import section of an old Dreamcast magazine but I didn't play it until way after the death of the Dreamcast. Why? Well, firstly, it wasn't released in the UK, and sure that wasn't really an issue thanks to a certain spinning reindeer, but honestly, an ugly Tamagotchi hybrid fish game, which if spoken incorrectly sounds like another word for spunk? Nah, not for me. America and Japan, you can keep this one. I'm going to go and use my Dreamcast microphone for something far more enjoyable. Anyway. As you may have guessed, several years later I finally discovered what it was about and like so many people out there, I was blown away. Seaman is one of the Dreamcast's many obscure little gems and yet another reason why it is so important to own one of the Big Blue's very best systems ever. So, join me as we take a look at the Seaman franchise. Yes, franchise, there is more than just one game here. As both myself and good friend of the show Jimmy Haffer take a look at its development, its crazy controllers, its weird ass marketing, and of course, the games. Welcome to Slopes Game Room. There is quite a lot to talk about here that has hardly ever been touched on in the past. Seaman is a crazily weird series of games that I feel haven't exactly been looked at in enough detail so far. Sure you know how the game works by now thanks to those big time YouTubers that I mentioned earlier, who by the way have skyrocketed the price of this game, but have you heard about this? This? Or even this? No, of course you haven't, and that's why you're here today, to push something far more important out of your brain, whilst Jimmy Happer and I go ahead and ooze as much of our personal Seaman knowledge directly into your brain. But hold up, hold up, Seaman 2, quirky controllers, unfunny sexual innuendos, <laughs> oh no no no, I think we're in fact getting a little ahead of ourselves. So, let's go back to the beginning. Introducing Yute Saito, easily most known for making the game that we're all talking about today. But he actually made a name for himself several years earlier with the breakthrough hit The Tower in 1994 in Japan and its sequel Ute Tower. Recognise it? Well, when it left Japan, Maxis, who were very well known for similar looking games, loved it so much that they quickly purchased the rights to publish the game under the popular Sim line of games. It was fairly uncommon for a Japanese developer to make such a western style game that would appeal to not only Will Wright, but more importantly a worldwide audience. Which was nice because it was Will Wright's incredibly popular SimCity that boosted Saito's interest in game development, and on several interviews that I've read, if it wasn't for that legendary SimCity game, he possibly wouldn't have even gone down the video game path. Now sure, it wasn't as popular as several other sim based games, especially SimCity, but it had its fans who were randomly dotted all over the world. 
The important thing is that this quality little game from a new game developer put Saito in the spotlight and shortly after he was approached by several companies. However, it was of course Sega who asked him to work on a new game for their twirly logoed console of dreams. During that initial meeting, Sega gave Saito and his team several options on what type of game they would like to make. According to Sega, these were guaranteed, surefire, worldwide successful genres that Saito was going to turn into a reality. So, what are these guaranteed formulas for global domination? Well, option one was a more advanced and improved typical Dungeons & Dragons style video game. Option 2 was an adventure game using famous licensed Hollywood characters and option 3 was a game focused around a rare beast that was like nothing ever created before. As you no doubt guess, he went for option 3. A strange choice for most but nothing but an obvious one for Saito. I'm a game creator who is good at making new games, I'm not good at making sequels. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure if that's true mate, considering the crazy amounts of sequels and remakes that this game got, but whatever, let's move on. The inspiration for Seaman came from several different sources. What you're looking at here are the obviously obscure original sketches for the game. However, it all started back when Saito was a child and his dad took him to a museum which is where he learnt about Silicant, a creature that at one point scientists had thought had long been extinct before obviously discovering it once again. On top of this, Vivarium had just created an aquarium simulator which the team somehow wanted to take advantage of. And the final seed of inspiration came from a stand-up comedian who at one point faced directly towards the camera and said, what are you looking at you dumbass? And one night in a bar, Saito talking about the comedian joked about a fish in a tank saying the exact same thing. So after creating the Seaman concept drawings, Yute Saito showed his wife to get her opinion and she hated it. But she still suggested that he went ahead with it anyway, because she couldn't get that ugly cave-like drawing out of her mind. This was when Saito realised the more people that hated a character, the more they became obsessed with them. So he decided to create a rude, unlikable, but memorable character. The design of Seaman came quickly after, with a moody persona staring directly into your living room, leaving the player confused, but intrigued. Saito's loyal team felt instantly in love with the idea, and according to interviews with Saito, they all quit their jobs to help push this concept forward. Even Sega, who I'm sure had no idea what they were looking at at first, fully fell in love with the idea. So, before we get into any more of the game's development and weird marketing, let's actually take a look at the game itself, shall we? Seaman is a virtual pet game, a very weird virtual pet game, which is like no other. When you think of virtual pets, you think of these things, Tamagotchis, and because of that, it's likely that you're going to be put off by it. Don't be. Seaman is a bizarre, almost grown-up experience in this genre that, like I said earlier, actually uses the Dreamcast microphone in order to play. After you set your tank's air and heating to just the right levels and drop in your Seaman egg, the game has begun. Nothing much happens in this early stage, you can poke the egg, you can move the rocks and well not really a lot else. But soon after that egg hatches and the real game begins. Now when I say the real game, well that's a bit of a stretch. You can obviously try and communicate with your Seaman which gets easier the more you go on, but it's still pretty bare bones. What I'm trying to say is that if you don't mess around with the Dreamcast clock, what you have is a very slow game. But hey, it's a virtual pet, of course it's going to be slow. 
However, it's when you get to the talking part in the game, when you and Seaman can communicate to one another, that it all becomes fully worth it. I've only once played through the game fully myself, but I have got to this stage several times. The more you play it, the more you realise how unique this game is. Not just in the graphical department, but also, and this may come to a bit of a shock, the initial intention of Saito is that Seaman would eventually start to raise you. It may sometimes take a bit of time, but he constantly asks you questions about your life, your family, your political views. It's a weird game, and that first time you play through it, it's just so exciting to pick up the controller and answer more questions. It's this brilliant back and forth that creates an amazing connection between you and your slim shady looking fish faced friend. And it's this unique twist on top of the tried and tested watch your pet grow to become something that you helped create formula, which gives you something that is truly unique and 100% fully deserving of its reputation. As you no doubt already know, Seaman's voice was Leonard Nimoy. Well, okay, Spock from Star Trek. I've heard this over and over again in reviews whilst creating my complete history. But actually, that's not true. The real voice actor was Jeff Cromer. Spock was just the narrator. Jeff also lent his voice to other several legendary games. He is E123 Omega in both Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games and Shadow the Hedgehog. He's Jaguar in Space Channel 5, which by the way, I've also done a complete history on. And he's also the Owl in the Wii game Night's Journey of Dreams. Oh, and by the way, I've done that one too. And it's his incredibly dry wit that can be found with Seaman that surely has got to be an absolute highlight of this video game voice actor's career. And if you want a good example of this, then put the game in your CD player. Has anyone ever put a Dreamcast disc in a CD player? You always get that iconic sound clip. This is a Dreamcast disc and is for use only on a Dreamcast unit. Playing this disc on a hi-fi or other audio equipment can cause serious damage to its speakers. Please stop this disc now. Well, awesomely, a different clip plays when you put Seaman in your CD player. This is a Sega Dreamcast disc. This is not a music CD. If you continue, you run the risk of transmitting deadly viral diseases to your household electronic appliances. Jeez, some people. So we've talked about the game, its history and its development. But did you know it also had one of Sega's more obscure marketing campaigns too? I actually featured this before in my top 10 crazy marketing stunts by Sega video. But for all those that haven't watched that yet, not only will I leave a nice clickable card right here for you, but I'll also give you a brief rundown. Mr. Sato basically had his website changed before the game came out to the American Science Journal Online, which was an online blog that not many people at the time realised was actually a promotion for a game. But obviously it was. It followed the French explorer looking for the elusive Seaman creature and was updated with images and videos of his latest scientific findings. According to old forums dotted about the internet, thank you Wayback Machine, this actually turned out to be a fairly popular as far as early 2000 internet marketing went and in my opinion it has got to be one of the strangest video game marketing pieces that the company has ever done. But then again the planned blowing up of a building to promote Streets of Rage 2 never went ahead. But that's a story for another time. Anyway, that fake explorer's blog ended on this fantastically poorly acted video just as hype for the game started to build up. Good evening, I'm Doreen Henderson and this is the 6 o'clock news. Our top story this evening concerns a legendary creature that some say could overturn Darwin's theory of evolution. Known as Seaman, this creature will go on public display for the first time in Japan. Seaman was first discovered in 1933 by the French biologist Jean-Paul Gasset. However, the lack of any living specimen cast doubt about its existence. All of that changed when a living Seaman was captured for the first time near Alexandria, Egypt. This astonishing event has focused worldwide attention on this unique creature. 
One of the most unusual characteristics of the sea man is its ability to undergo rapid genetic change. This allows the creature to adapt to its environment by morphing into various forms. Researchers have also discovered that knowledge gained by one sea man can be passed on to later generations on a genetic level. This latest information lends new credibility to Professor Gasset's original theory that the sea man has the ability to pass knowledge to future generations, allowing the creatures to contribute to the development of ancient civilizations. Noted researcher Professor William Sutherland of the Institute of Bioanthroarchaeology is in Japan to oversee the sea man exhibit. Now, obviously, even though the marketing was bloody ingenious, Seaman wasn't exactly flying off the shelves. I mean, it did well, but obviously it wasn't exactly a huge seller. With that said, Sega actually wasn't expecting the game to do as well as it did, and Saito remembers being frustrated when sales for the microphone sold out, and the game got put on serious back order, while Sega scrambled to make more. Weirdly, it seems it wasn't existing Dreamcast owners that lapped up the game, but instead the game ended up attracting a large female audience which resulted in quite a few sales of the system in Japan. Because of this, quite a few limited editions and crazy variants of the game ended up being released as well as the often overlooked sequel to the cult classic Seaman 2. This is something I've wanted to talk about and look into for a really long time. Plus, it's actually quite cheap. The only issue is I can't speak or understand Japanese, a pretty big hurdle for a game built around communication. So, for the first time ever on a complete history, I'll be handing you over into the very capable hands of Jimmy Happer, who will dig deep into the unknown world of Japanese exclusive Seaman goodness. And apparently, there's quite a bit. Jimmy, take it away. That's right, Larry. Compared to the rest of the world, Seaman managed to spill onto a whole lot of products and merchandise in Japan. Beyond the original Dreamcast game, there were guides and fan books, of course, but so much more, including the bizarre official soundtrack and drama CDs, Seaman plushies, promotional figurines, keychains, clothing, and the like. There were even cell phone applications from before the smartphone era, allowing you to play with your Seaman on the go as well as Cmail for Windows, a desktop application that helped manage schedules and send messages. Kind of like a Seaman themed Outlook, with a baby Gilman taking on the role of desktop assistant. This software also came with an extra disc called the Present Disc, which you could give to someone to access special messages from you through email, but delivered via Seaman. Pretty cool, huh? However, the real cool Japanese Seaman goodness came in the form of games and gaming hardware. There was the official Seaman Skeleton Case Dreamcast console, a beauty of a system that came with a limited edition of the game. And for a very brief period in the winter of 1999, an amazing Christmas Seaman package was made available that came bundled with a gorgeous red console and a holiday themed Seaman game set. This software, titled Christmas Seaman, Omoyo Tsutairu Mo Hitotsu no Hoho, or another way of sending your thoughts, allowed users to send a special Christmas greeting to a friend or loved one, which would be sent by email and accessed by a special present disc, just like with Cmail. One such disc was included in each kit, but more could be purchased separately for about 10 US dollars each, and the full kit was available apart from the console bundle for about $30. This service was only up until early January of the following year, so these discs have been simple collector's items for quite a long time now. And as for the last drop of Seaman on the Dreamcast, near the end of the year 2000, developer Vivarium self-published an updated 2001 edition in Japan to coincide with the North American release. This included all the bug fixes and improvements made for that version, among them tweaks to game progression and balance, improved speech recognition, and an increased range of vocabulary and topics of conversation for your virtual pet. In an effort to promote the game to women and casual gamers, it was also marketed and sold at convenience stores such as 7-Eleven. The next year, Seaman would make its way to Sony's popular PlayStation 2, courtesy of ASCII. A standard PS2 USB microphone can be used to communicate with, but ASCII crafted a special microphone equipped controller, dubbed the C-Mic, for use especially with this game, which came packed in with the software. A second, more stylized Seaman controller was also put on the market, this one done all in gold and made to look like an ancient Egyptian artifact. 
either of these controllers work just fine, and can be used as microphones for other PS2 games that enable voice functionality. The jump to a newer, more powerful platform translated to sharper graphics, more detailed textures, and a smoother frame rate, as well as improved communication features over its Dreamcast predecessor. But this edition of Seaman is much more than a simple port with a facelift, as this little sticker on the cover of the game alludes to. While it's not a completely different game, there are many changes to how the game progresses, as well as newly added content. The egg-hatching and Nautilus birth scenarios have been scrapped, and acquiring a seaman is now done in the waters off of Micronesia, where you can lure one in by dropping a bug larva into the ocean. After caring for and conversing with this baby gillman, you can take him to the lab, and the game plays out mostly like it does on the Dreamcast. However, the feeding routine has also been changed quite drastically. Instead of having an inventory box of pellets and raising bugs in a cage, procuring food takes place in a lush forest, where you can rip off bark from a tree to collect bug larvae or catch flying moss to give to your seaman for sustenance. Because you can now only raise one pet at a time, in order to progress further than the podman form, you must release your precious seaman into the ocean and find a suitable partner, a sea woman, who you'll have to converse with over several days to gain her trust. And where the original ended, the PS2 edition continues on, and your Seaman will meet his Dreamcast predecessor in a bizarre breaking of the fourth wall that, when it comes to this series, is honestly not surprising in the least. More surprising is finding a Dreamcast logo in a PlayStation 2 game. If these two Seamen meet up again in Mate, they'll give birth to another type of Seaman beyond the froggy type, Iguani, which as the name suggests, has the body of an iguana. The final step towards seeing the end credits is teaching this lazy, somewhat reclusive creature how to swim, and freeing him into the ocean, where he can embark on bigger adventures on his own. Something. Much like the Dreamcast release, the PlayStation 2 also got itself an updated version of Seaman, this time put out by D3 Publisher in 2003. Dubbed the Kanzenban, or Complete Edition, it added a few new features to the game, such as pressing select throughout to get detailed explanations and hints from the narrator, as well as a journal that tracks your progress in the game. This edition also reintroduces the egg hatching and Nautilus bits back into the mix, making this the definitive version of Seaman. Well, for anyone who speaks Japanese, anyway. In the eyes of fans of the Dreamcast game, Seaman on the PS2 is probably a pretty neat addition to the series. But there's an even neater Seaman release that never left its home country that all should be aware of. The 2007 Sega published Seaman 2 also for Sony's second console. Looking at the cover, you might think that our little Seaman has evolved to the point where his entire body matches his human face, but the game's subtitle, Peking Genji Ikusei Kitto, or the Peking Man Raising Kit, should instantly cast doubt on that thought. While there are many elements in the sequel that are reminiscent of the game that came before it, overall it's a very different experience as the game's introduction should clue you onto, where you are charged with creating a small island, as well as life, on a tiny planet, eventually to the point where said island becomes lush and vibrant. The star of Seaman 2 is no Seaman at all, and as the name of the game suggests, it focuses on the exploits of a Peking man, a prehistoric ancestor of modern humans whose remains were initially discovered in China in the 1920s. This little fellow's name is Gabochan, and he's basically a helpless blank slate starting off. So it's up to you to take care of him as he explores the small island. And at least at first, Seaman 2 is less of a virtual pet simulator and more of a god simulation game. The degree with which you can communicate with Gabochan is quite limited, since you can only teach him basic vocabulary and give him the simplest of commands, but he learns quickly. You can tap around the screen to get his attention, but more often you'll use a denden daiko, or Japanese pellet drum, that the furry fella finds and gifts to you early on to get him to move around and interact with objects. He has both a visible happiness and fullness meter, so you know when it's a good time to fetch him a banana or lift his spirits with a bit of tickling, just like the original game. Gameplay takes place over the course of one in-game day, which usually lasts between 30 minutes to an hour, and can be played just once per real-world day, 
though you can change the date settings in your PS2 if you're impatient. Gobblechon can fetch items for you on the island, such as pearls, which can be exchanged for cash, which in turn can be exchanged for more items or food for Gobblechon. Oddly, there's quite a bit of product placement in this game, and you'll be able to spend your money on real-life items like Meiji brand chocolate and Pepsi Cola to feed your tiny pal. The Peking Man isn't all alone on the island, because there are various animals he can learn how to hunt for food and skins, and later on he'll meet Lucy, a female love interest based on the famous primate of the same name that was discovered in Africa in the 1940s. You have a small battery-run device at your disposal that can simulate weather effects, allowing you to generate winds and rain, earthquakes to heat up the island, and lightning bolts, which are usually used to clear out trees, stun animals to aid in hunting, and set piles of sticks on fire to cook fish and meat. So far, Seaman 2 seems completely removed from the original, huh? But fans of the first game going through Seaman withdrawals need not despair, as the weird, iconic manfish frog actually does play a major role in this strange sim. Seaman, or should I say, Sea Man Bird, has evolved quite a bit since we last saw him, and proclaims himself to be the master of the island. Throughout the game, he'll narrate important milestones, offer advice, and sometimes even give the player items to pass along onto the cavemen. But most importantly, he is the person who pays for the various pearls, skins, and other goods you collect, as well as the merchant who sells food and tools. He greets you each morning and night, and engages in conversation over a broad range of topics, both deep and silly, much like he did in the Dreamcast prequel. And every evening, he'll even offer to tell your fortune before heading out. For a price. Seaman 2 takes the player on quite a journey with Gobblechon, who experiences the joys of life, as well as the tragedy of death. Like all mortal creatures, in time, Gobblechon himself becomes a victim to fate, leaving behind a small child, Yusuke, exclusively in your care. This child soon grows into a man, one scores more intelligent than his parents, and capable of normal communication with the player through a cell phone. In a way, Seaman 2 only truly begins when Yusuke becomes the center of the game, and transforms from a simple god simulation into a more appropriate sequel to Seaman. Anyway, I could go on and on about this game, but I'll cut it here, since I think everyone should have a pretty clear idea of what Seaman 2 is all about by now. I want to thank Larry for having me on here so I could talk about these Japan-only Seaman games. I've been wanting to cover them for ages. Maybe I'll do a proper import gaming for the win episode on Seaman 2 someday. Who knows? Anyway, Larry, buddy, back to you. Larry? Larry? Who the f is Larry? Seaman! <laughs> 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 Anyway, as you've now seen, the Seaman franchise is quite a bit bigger than you originally expected. I was blown away when creating this episode at just how big it was. In fact, the franchise almost had another game made for it on the 3DS under the working title Seaman 3DS. But it was the sad passing of Satoru Iwata, who was a good friend of Yute Saito, that unfortunately ended its development as seen here in a blog post written by Saito shortly after his death. In the blog post he explains that Satoru Iwata was tasked with a special assignment to get new types of games that haven't been on a Nintendo platform before. Sadly due to complications on Saito's side, he had to let the project go. It's worth reading the whole thing as it's quite the love letter to that legendary Nintendo icon. So, that's it right? Well, actually no. 
In fact, it doesn't look like it's going to be the complete history of Seaman for very long, which, like I've said before, is nothing but a good thing. Yute Saito and his team of Seaman creators are back, and according to several Twitter snaps, it looks like a new game is actually in development. Is it a remake? Is it a sequel? Is it the ultimate journey splurging both Seaman 1 and 2 together to create the ultimate Seaman experience? I bloody hope so. Fingers crossed that this game eventually does see the light of day, and that videos like this one, as well as the ones from those mighty popular English speaking YouTubers out there, will help raise awareness on the Seaman franchise, so we can get a nice translated version over here too. And Sega, if you're watching this video when this game does come out, please invite me to the aquarium launch party. I want to get myself some nice tin semen. Seaman, seaman, seaman. Damn it. Hey there guys, it's the part of the video where I give my usual Patreon shout outs. But first, how can I not give a shout out to the person that has helped make this Seaman the Complete History video a reality? Two massive thumbs way way up to my good friend Jimmy Happer, who has been a huge influence to this channel for an extremely long time. If you are not subscribed, click the link in the description and go and subscribe, you will not be disappointed. But anyway, back to the Patreons. This time I want to give a special shout out to Matthew Ritter, Ryan Burford, Ian A. Chapman, Phil Lolin, Zane Powers, Justin French, Pop Goes Rock Band, Garin Geeman, Creamy Elephant, JL87, Casey Garner, Blitz Hedgy, Ben Hall, Taylor Armands, and Killer J. Takikawa, and of course, Tiago Piera Dos Santos Silva. If you want to be part of this list, get your name shown, get your name shouted out, come and check out the Discord channel, share your creations as well as seeing things that I'm working on as I'm working working on them, as well as plenty of other Patreon only perks like exclusive videos, playthroughs and commentaries, then please click the link that you see on the screen. Don't forget to subscribe, give it a thumbs up, a thumbs down, whatever you prefer. And as always, if you are those people sharing my videos on social media channels and places like Reddit, a big thank you to you. But for now, this is DJ Slope signing out, and hopefully... I'll see you all next time.